he had a donor, I spoke with him a, a few weeks ago, and he said he was able to give $50,000 to a local hospital who needed money for protective equipment. And he said he would not have been able to write that check if he didn't have a donor advice fund and was able to continue to give to it over the last few years. Welcome to The Value in Giving. I'm your host and Vanguard Charitable's president, Jane Greenfield. On this podcast, we'll hear from leaders across the world of philanthropy. They'll share tips and stories with us to help people and organizations make the most of their charitable efforts. On today's show, we have Nicole Taylor, president and chief executive officer of Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Thanks so much for joining me today, Nicole. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jane. Thanks for having me. You got it. Well, I've been reflecting, you know, it's April 2020 now, and we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the value in giving seems all the more important as the need is so great right now. And I was just thinking about the first time we met Nicole, which was over a year ago, you had joined Silicon Valley Community Foundation as its leader. And um, although that was a relatively short time ago, it feels like the world has changed. The world has changed and dare I say forever? Potentially, yeah. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the current state and we'll broaden it as well, but you and I have had, in that time of knowing each other, we've had this great opportunity to do a lot of work together and to actually really get to know each other personally. So now I'd love for our listeners to get to know you. So Nicole, can you please share a little bit about your background and tell us a little bit about the Silicon Valley Community Foundation as well and your role within the organization? So my personal story is an interesting one. Most people do not know that I am the daughter of an immigrant. My mother came from Jamaica with a little more than a sixth grade education and came as a domestic for a fairly affluent family. And I was born and raised in Los Angeles as the daughter of the the domestic as the daughter of the help. And she would always tell me that I would have to prove myself and be 100% better than everyone else just to be seen and heard and recognized. And I got a full ride to Stanford and I owe a debt of gratitude, not just to my mother, I wouldn't be here without her, but also being grounded at Stanford and the education I got there. You know, as an immigrant, you're told to be like a doctor or lawyer, pretty much. And I tried to be on that med school path and realized chemistry was not my friend. So I became a public school teacher, at which my mother was um, almost horrified because she said this country doesn't really uh, respect or invest in education or their teachers. And what was I going to do? Because how would I be able to make it, make a living, given how poorly teachers were paid? And I'd say I'd work it out. So I did end up teaching both in Palo Alto and then worked in West Oakland, which was the exact opposite. And I got to see the public school system from both ends of the spectrum and decided that I needed to be about systems change and other kind of change and really fell into philanthropy and nonprofit work and ended up at the East Bay Community Foundation for about gosh, 15 years, six of it as their president, then went on to run a private foundation and then did a stint both at Stanford and at Arizona State University when I got the call to come back to Silicon Valley, where I feel like I've come full circle. And I said, of course, I'll have a conversation about joining the foundation in a community that I care very deeply about. And I was asked to take the role on, and I did. And it's been an incredible year and three, four months um, that I've been on this, on this job as its, as its new leader, uh, an incredible year of change. And the foundation that we've been envisioning is coming to fruition because of the work that we've been doing in COVID and responding. We wanted to be an organization that was going to be about reducing systemic disparities and we're facing that head on right now. This pandemic has revealed the ugly truth about inequality and inequity in our country. Um, we wanted to be a foundation that was about creating strong and engaged communities. This pandemic is allowing for us to think about how do we create community. We wanted to be a foundation that's about building a culture of effective philanthropy. We sit in the wealthiest region 
in the country, one of the top in the world, how do we help our donors? How do we help the philanthropists who are here be effective with their philanthropy? How do we help the companies who are, you know, have done quite well and want to give back and want to be good corporate citizens? How do we help them think about their giving? It's been great to see your impact as the leader of the organization. And um, I do think, you know, while this is a very, very difficult time, not only for your community, but for our country and really the world, it is really energizing to at least be able to be part of the solution. We're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the response that Silicon Valley Community Foundation or SVCF, as I will call it as well is doing. But before we do that, let's just step back a little bit and talk about the role of the Community Foundation. For those listeners who have not worked with one before, can you tell me a little bit about how giving to a Community Foundation might be different than giving directly to a quote-unquote charity on the ground? And what are the benefits? Sure. And one, if you haven't worked with your local Community Foundation, I encourage you to do so. There's over 800 of us We literally serve every major region in every state and play what I think is a critical role in communities. And the roles are really twofold. One, obviously, we are here to help donors, people who want to give and be philanthropic, and we work to help them get their money to the ground and to have the greatest impact with their giving. And two is a responsibility to support the vitality and the sustainability of our communities, to understand what the needs are, understand what the assets are in a community, and how to get resources to build on what communities really need. And we are responsible for the marriage of the two. So for those people who care deeply about making a difference in their community, but are really not sure how best to do that, their local community foundation is probably the first stop. Absolutely. You know, almost all of us, if not all 800, we work with our local governments. Many of us, like we do, work with county governments and our state. We've been in constant communication with our governor, as you can imagine, over the last couple months. We work with our business community. We work with individuals. We work with nonprofits, you know, and we try to understand how public-private partnerships can work, how we need leverage individual philanthropy with institutional philanthropy, other foundations in our region, as well as with public dollars. Those are the kinds of things that community foundations do. It's complicated. It can be messy. Um, and that, But that's the role we take on. So donors don't have to try to navigate it on their own because it can be really hard to navigate. So Nicole, can you tell me a story, and, and we'll get into the COVID response in a minute, but even before that, can you tell me a story about how SVCF has been able to create long-lasting change in the community? Yes. One of the things that we do is research and public policy work. And in terms of long-standing change, that's absolutely critical to add to the mix of actually grant dollars getting out the door. So part of our public policy work has been around housing and the homelessness crisis, and we are doubling down on that. And it's going to be even more critical as we recover from this pandemic. But we supported uh, work by UC Berkeley Law School and Columbia University. They were conducting an analysis of land entitlement processes in 16 jurisdictions here locally in our two counties. And this study engaged legislators here in California to ensure that they drew up legislation that helped protect critical housing. We were able to do that the public sector couldn't have done or that even an individual nonprofit or these two institutions couldn't have done on their own. And that allowed us to bring to bear issues like protecting renters who are experiencing unjust housing evictions and displacement, about preserving existing affordable housing, increasing the production of new affordable housing. So this research actually allowed us to share it with other foundations and share it with other policymakers so that they can make informed decisions about where they were giving or the local policies that they were trying to enact. You know, so much of your work is really focused on kind of long-term investment, long-term policy impact, et cetera. But right now, we're very focused on the here and now with the COVID pandemic. And, you know, one of the things that we at Vanguard Charitable have done with our donors is to make them aware that if they are interested in giving immediate response help on the ground, that community foundations are a great place to turn to. So tell me a little bit about how SBCF is supporting the COVID-19 relief in your community. 
early on, back in early February, we have a relationship with the CDC because we had helped with the Ebola crisis. And they said, it's just a matter of time before this starts hitting the United States. So we thought, well, let's launch a fund to support the CDC's efforts, right? Because we don't know what it's gonna look like and we can always pivot to local needs once we figure out what that even looks like. So this was early February, we launched the fund and within two weeks, it had hit uh, Washington state. And I was on the phone with colleagues from other community foundations of the region and some of my private foundation colleagues, CEOs, and they were all wondering, well, what should we do? Because this is probably going to hit us too. We're on the West Coast, the Pacific Rim. It's only a matter of days probably before the Bay Area sees it. And I suggested, well, why don't we turn the fund that we started at SVCF into a regional fund? And they were like, yes. So within 24 hours, we switched it to a regional response fund. And the focus was to help individuals and families who would be most in need in this pandemic. Again, not quite knowing what we were about to see. And then probably within a few days after that, we realized, well, there are two other critical pieces of the pie here in our community. One is the nonprofit sector and the other is the small business sector. The nonprofit sector provides the vital services in communities and they will probably get hit and need more resources as they figure out how to do things like clean equipment or feed more people, if they're food banks, that kind of thing. So we set up a regional nonprofit fund, again, with our partner community foundations in the region. And then the governor's office actually asked us to set up the small business fund. And this is again, before the CARES Act had started, but we knew small businesses are critical. Before, the, before this crisis, most small businesses, like two thirds, only had 15 days of cash on hand. So how do you go into a crisis with that, right? And they actually employ most of the average residents in a community, particularly immigrants, uh, people of color, undocumented workers. So we set those three funds up, which actually allowed donors to figure out what they had a passion for. Was it helping an individual and a family? Was it helping the nonprofit sector get through this time? Or is it to help the small businesses in their community that might need help navigating now, navigating the CARES Act and, and the assistance that the federal government is providing? So that proved to be a really wise decision that we made, just feeling our way through and listening to our community leaders, public leaders around what they think was going to be needed. You explained a few different shifts along the way. And just listening to that story, you could imagine that that would be a story that would unfold over years. That's unfolded un over weeks. Yes. The needs have evolved. The needs have changed and shifted and grown. Yes. yes. How do you keep in front of your donors and in front of the nonprofits with what you're doing and how they can be either part of the solution or grab the solution? Well, you know, the community foundations, I think, are primed in terms of helping the philanthropists and helping the donors. So we have staff literally every day that are responding to emails, getting on Zoom calls, and getting on phone calls with our donors to try to help them through this. Feeding them information, data that we're seeing, stories. You know, I have tons of stories that I can tell you about what we're hearing and really trying to understand what the donors care about and letting them know what the need is and trying to match it up. And again, making it easy. We have these three funds. We also have turned our education grant making right now because education is completely flipped on its head, right? With shelter in place, uh, we've turned our million dollar competitive grant making in education to support our two county offices of education that are dispersing dollars to every district, trying to make sure kids have devices, right? Poor kids don't have devices. Right. You know, so we shifted our own grant making to, to that. And, and we have the donors who are interested in supporting that. So we are just constantly in communication with our donors to let them know what the needs are. The other thing that we're letting them know is that we're in response mode. We need you to be giving and give generously now above and beyond what you're doing and then be prepared to give towards recovery because we don't know what that's going to look like, but we know there's going to be need and the need is going to look different than right now. 
I also recorded a video for our donors that asked them to give up to 5% of a donor advice fund assets to response efforts right now. And that's above and beyond what they were planning to do. Nicole, that's a great message. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about how engaged our donors are. I mean, our donors are deeply engaged and deeply committed to not just give, but give frequently. So, so that's not a small ask. And I'm thrilled to hear them responding. We're seeing Vanguard charitable donors, um, as they've always been engaged right now, they're engaged on steroids. It's a really exciting piece of this. As difficult as it's been, it's kind of inspiring to see people want to rush in and help. No, it is. It is. We've never really put that call out to our donors like that. Right. So to ask them to give above what they're normally giving is pretty incredible. And it's just um, heartening. It gives me hope. And especially on those days when you're just hearing about the numbers and you're hearing about how we don't have enough equipment, you're hearing just all of the hard stuff to hear about what our donors are doing with the average person who has been able to be fortunate in life and put money away in their donor advice fund and wanting to give it and give generously. It gives me hope. It really does that when we get through this, we will be redefined as a nation. We're going to be redefined as communities. I don't think people are going to let go the fact that this pandemic has shown that we, our lives are inextricably linked. Your health is important to my life. My health is important to your life, period. Thanks, Nicole. We'll be right back. It really just reminds us we're all human. We're all going through these things together. The other thing that's been really rewarding to see is this COVID disaster has not only been a health disaster, but it's been a financial one as well, with a lot of people losing their jobs. And, you know, in the land of philanthropy, when the markets are down, people have less to give. But donors with donor advised funds really think about that bucket of money differently. When the markets go down, they're much more resilient givers. You and I know that. Yeah, we had a donor. I spoke with him a, a few weeks ago, um, and he has a donor advice fund. And he said he was able to give $50,000 to a local hospital who needed money for protective equipment, PPE. And he said he would not have been able to write that check if he didn't have a donor advice fund and was able to continue to give to it over the last few years. He would not even have come close to being able to meet that kind of need or that kind of ask from a hospital that had done well by him and his family before, right? So if he didn't have that vehicle to use, it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to give. He was very grateful that he had, he had done that. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see how impactful it is on the givers as well as the receivers in this. What do you think the long-term impact of COVID-19 on philanthropy will be? One, I think people are going to give more general support to nonprofits. I also think that philanthropy is paying attention now more than ever to structural inequities in our communities. Uh, Our public health system has been woefully underfunded, clearly. We're seeing it right now. Different parts of the country are seeing racial inequities in terms of who's dying from it. The, the, the data from Louisiana, you know, when you have the black population is 32% of the state's population, yet almost 80% of who's dying, it's horrible. So I think it's bringing to light some structural inequities that means philanthropy can step up and help. The other thing, the hard thing is there's going to be a lot of loss in our nonprofit sector. It is going to be really hard for all nonprofits to survive this. Um, Nonprofits who haven't been able to build a reserve or haven't been able to build a strong donor community or diversify different ways of getting revenue, it's going to be tough. I think we're going to be facing mergers or acquisitions in the nonprofit sector and some nonprofits literally just closing. It's going to be tough. 
Well, you know, it really underlines the importance of the message that you sent to your donors of giving 5% above and beyond what they had given. And that's because you naturally think about healthcare workers who need masks or children who are not in school now, so they need breakfast and lunch that they would have gotten in school. Like there are some things that people think about, but what they may not think about is the nonprofit that they've always supported in the past that have their annual event And if they don't have it, they don't get the revenue. So there's a lot of victims of this pandemic that people may not naturally think about. So I think you're right. I think it's going to be tough on some nonprofits. Right. And what we've been telling nonprofits as well, in addition, they're applying to our nonprofit emergency fund, is you need to communicate right now with your donor base. Be honest about the impact it's going to have on you and the clients, customers, communities that you serve so that donors know that this is the time that they need to write that check that they would have written for the chicken dinner and the gala that they would have had to get dressed up in, you know, to go to, that now's the time to give so that they can weather the storm. You know, nonprofits can apply for some of the Small Business Administration help through the CARES Act, but as we've seen, that's been hard. Well, Nicole, it's very apparent that you have a lot of passion and energy for what you do, which I love, which I already knew. But tell me a little bit about what makes your work with SVCF so personal to you. So I'm going to read you a story that we got. And I think this epitomizes why I keep doing what I do. So this was told to us by a nonprofit worker who's dispersing dollars directly to individuals and families. Today I spoke with a new mom who was on maternity leave. Her name is Rachel. She is a mom of three. The youngest is her baby girl. She works as a manager at a fitness gym. She was supposed to go back to work on March 17th, but due to shelter in place, she was unable to do so. To make matters worse, her family paid leave expired and she cannot reapply. She heard about our COVID program on TV. Although she applied, she didn't believe it could be real. She earned $17 an hour as a manager at a fitness gym and worked full time. I gave her the news today that she will be awarded over $1,700 plus a $500 gift card. She started crying. She couldn't believe we were replacing her income. She's thanked the county, the donors, and those behind the desk processing applications. That's why I do what I do. Life impact, right? Right. Person by person. You know, those of us who are listening to this podcast, oh, I can't go to the gym. The gym manager couldn't figure out how to feed her family. Yeah, that's a bit of a bigger problem. Right. You know, I feel like we should just take a minute to uh, <laughs> to pull ourselves back together after that one, Nicole. But we'll keep we'll keep chatting. There's so many real stories out there of people who have such fears and concerns, and if you can rush in and be part of the solution, it's unbelievable. Right. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. You have uh, you have a passion for your mission. I have a passion for our mission. Our missions have a whole lot in common. But what's interesting about this, and you and I have talked about this, in the past, national donor advice funds like Vanguard Charitable and community foundations like Silicon Valley have not always worked together. No. There's been a bit of a silo. Silo and sometimes competitive. You know, it's a new day. We we are like, we need to collaborate and partner for the sake of not just our communities, our country. Well, I think you've been a great leader on your side. And, um, and you know, same for you, Jane. Thanks, Nicole. So I thought a great way for you and I to wrap up would be to answer some of the questions that you and I get all the time from our donors. We have these wonderful jobs where we get to meet with people who really want to do a good job in giving back. And um, they, they challenge us with questions. So I'll start with uh, with one we hear all the time. In your experience, what is the best way for people to see or measure the impact of their giving dollars? The first thing that I tell donors is to understand what you're passionate about and identifying organizations that help meet that passion. That's number one. And once you identify those organizations, you need to understand how they measure success, how they understand what it means to have impact. Because your version of impact may look very different from theirs. And if you're not in alignment, see if there can be an alignment. And if there's not, 
then you really need to think if that's one, the issue you care about, or if this is the right organization for you to be investing in. You know, saying you want to solve poverty, you're going to be woefully disappointed that your dollars didn't help solve poverty. But they can help thousands of people get fed in a period of time. Right. Which is critical, right? So it's working through just at the uh, upfront, having that understanding, I, I think goes a long way in terms of people measuring their giving dollars. I think that's great advice. Um, so I, I'll ask you to, to wrap up with me. I'll give you uh, a chance to tell all of our listeners, most of whom are philanthropists, um, but some of whom are leaders in nonprofits. Mm-hmm. What is your most important piece of advice right now for donors? And what is your most important piece of advice right now for nonprofits? For donors, give and give generously. Give more than you actually thought you could give, period. Uh, For nonprofits, get in touch with your donors right now today and the foundations and funders that have funded you in the past so they understand what your needs are and what you're forecasting as your needs to be. Well, that is great advice. Couldn't have said it better myself, Nicole. Very happy to have you here. Thank you for, for joining me today and for sharing your, your life, your experience, and um, thanks to you and your organization for all the incredible work that you're doing. Oh, great. Thank you again for having me. It's been an honor and a pleasure being with you, Jane. Thanks, Nicole. And to our listeners, I hope everyone found today's show interesting and informative, and I hope you all find the value in giving.